We are so glad to have our friend and neighbor Jeff Hansen here with us today. After spending several years in Brazil, he returned to his home on Birch Lake, where he originally moved to in, in 1959, I think mm -hmm. he said. And he is a mechanical and environmental engineer who was trained at the University of Minnesota. And he's got a particular interest in local issues related to the environment, social justice, and our mining legacy up here. And so the sulfate in mining impacted waters has become, as you know, a, a divisive issue. And Jeff decided to work on solving that issue rather than shouting about it. And we appreciate that. Um, after 15 years of working on sulfate remediation, there is now a viable and cost effective system to resolve the issue. And Jeff has had the pleasure of speaking about this topic at Tuesday Group before, but it's been several years and there are lots of updates. And so we are going to learn about that from him right now. Welcome, Jeff. Very good. Thank you, Lacey, and welcome. Good to see you all here. I'm going to grab this from my other hand because Lacey tells me I need to talk right into it. So just get it out of there first. Okay. Um, first off, as she said, my name is Jeff Hansen. Yep, I'm from close to here. Um, and just so you can identify me, I am a guy in black, okay? But I can't sing. I love Johnny Cash but that's not why I'm dressed in black. The reason I'm dressed in black is because, and remember this for later, there's gonna be a quiz. I make black stuff. So then it doesn't show up as much as if I wore a white shirt. But anyway, we're gonna start out talking a little bit about sulfate first. You had lots of time to read this list, so I'm not gonna read it to you. Uh, on that, so you know what the standards are, the wild rice standard, all this methylation of sequestered mercury, et cetera. But I'm going to jump back five years now to, oh, help me, Lacey. There's a song about that, isn't there? No, no, I'll leave. Yeah, and they helped me, Rhonda. Yeah, okay. That's, what's that? Uh, there we go, okay, very good. Okay, I'm gonna refer back just for starters to put things into perspective. The 2018 Tribal Wild Rice Task Force Report. Back in 2018, I'm sure everybody remembers that there was the Governor's Wild Rice Task Force. They did a report too, but it didn't have very good visuals. So I like this one that was done by the tribes, kind of like the dissenting opinions. And just as a reference on that, you see the big, Blue section, whoops. That's the number of places where sulfate levels are low. The little one up on the top there, this 2% wedge is where it's really high sulfate. Just to say, this all based on DNR and MPCA data compiled by the tribes. High sulfate is not the general rule but it is someplace. And so from that report also, you can probably see the format here of the iron range, the lightning bolt, right? The yellow dots represent the larger the dot, the higher the concentration of sulfate. And their point on this is that there are point sources of sulfate along the range that cause the downstream sulfate, this is the St. Louis River, to be high in some of those ones. Here's Dark River, here's the Mintac Basin, here's the Sand River going up into Lake Vermilion, why Pike Bay on Lake Vermilion is declared impaired for that. This is Spring Mine Creek, which you guys probably don't know much about, but that's where we used to get our water. And its headwaters are Area 5 of the old Erie LTV Taconite Mine site. It has uh, fairly high sulfate, and we'll see where it comes from. And then the Partridge River, which has lots of different contributions here. Up here is the only area that feeds into the Boundary Waters Canoe Area via Birch Lake, White Iron, Garden Farm Lake, into Fall Lake, and up into the Boundary Waters. It does not have super high, but it is an area that affects the Boundary Waters. This affects Lake Vermilion, 
this affects Voyager National Park. But just to see that there are point sources that contribute to the high sulfate that's of concern. Why is it of concern? This uh, graphic done by Amy Mybro. And just to understand that there's really only two chemical or biological processes that you need to worry about. Or sulfate is SO4. It's in the water. When it goes into the mud, muck at slow moving rivers in that, where there's organic matter, food for it, the microbes, sulfate reducing bacteria, convert it to hydrogen sulfide, rotten egg smell, toxic gas, get enough of it, it'll kill you. You gotta get enough of it. And then if there is iron available and the right kind of iron, it will react with the hydrogen sulfide and form a solid insoluble iron sulfide, which is where the sulfur came from in the first place to make the sulfate, okay? So that process is something that we are biomimicking, like I say, following nature's lead, and understanding that sulfate reducing bacteria, these beastie guys here, also methylate mercury. So you don't wanna do this where there's mercury, because we don't want methylation of mercury, because that's what gets in the fish and bioaccumulates. So that's your lesson on sulfate and what happens in nature. We're not doing that, but we want to do it in accelerated form. So Clearwater Biologic came along in our timeline starting about 2010 and through now, 2024, we developed a way to mimic nature in a controlled fashion to reduce sulfate. This is just a picture of our field test up in Area 5, Erie Mining, in Brownfield mine area that Polymet at the time was hoping to uh, take over and actually clean it up. But what you note on it, totally solar power driven, okay? Where we located at that? Well, Babbitt, some of you might know where Babbitt is, not many, but some. There's my house there right on Birch Lake. Here's that, this where Twin Metals wants to use something. Here's the Dunka Pit, left over from Erie Mining, it's of significance. North Shore Mining, right down here is where we did our field test, okay? On the creek that runs north up to here uh, where it meets the Embarrassed River, okay? That's just to show where it was. Here's Google view of it showing, oh, come on back. There we go. The little mine pit lake. All of these mine pit lakes here flow north, not south, into Spring Mine Creek. There you can see us building our bioreactors right there. You can't see it anymore on Google Earth because they renew them and refresh them and all that stuff. But I got it and it was good. Our concept is floating bioreactors. Basically what we're doing is we are encapsulating or capturing a volume of water that we can then monitor the inlets, outlets, and have our bacteria grow. In this environment, we're in a mine pit lake that has high sulfate, low oxygen, no mercury, and we're below the freeze zone. Why? They're floating. So under the ice, by definition, it's no longer ice, it's water. So we're in a no freeze zone, which means it can operate all things. These are just big plastic bags, basically, okay? And we build them, we float them, we fill them with fiber so that they have lots of surface area, 26 acres worth per unit. And that's what allows us to build a huge community of sulfate reducing bacteria because they attach to these fibers. There you can see a picture of the fibers. We're not going to dwell a whole lot on that, but we have a huge surface area for them. We float them in the water, they start working, we feed the bacteria, and they reduce the sulfate to hydrogen sulfide. And they operate even in the winter time. So like right now, no problem. Under the ice, it's still water about the same temperature. In these pit lakes, it doesn't vary much during the year. Okay, so we did that. The results we've gotten from that, first off, it's a modular system. So it can operate year round. You saw it in the snow. It can operate summer, winter. It's scalable because it's module. 
you do more modules, it's modular, you can do more modules, handle any flow. We have consistently demonstrated 99 plus percent of sulfate reduction. And the hydrogen sulfite that's generated, we are eliminating with reactive iron. And we'll talk more about that later. Methyl mercury production, absolutely insignificant. In taconite mine pit lakes, there is very, very, very low, almost non-detectable mercury, much lower than our natural lakes because it's circulating out and mercury tends to adsorb onto taconite. And we produce iron sulfide, which has value. And we have the potential of producing, well, we do produce hydrogen, but we have the potential of being able to collect the hydrogen, which is, could be significant in the future. This is a graph. I don't know if you folks like graphs or whatever, but I tend to. Here's when we were using water from the Spring Mine Creek, which I had mentioned, about 250 milligrams per liter of sulfate, but it varies. It's the creek. We're down about two miles from the pit lake where we did our field test. So if you have a spring runoff, you have a rainstorm, it changes, okay? Then we got permission from the DNR and we started taking water from the St. James Mine Pit Lake right by Aurora. Why do I keep doing that? Anyway, it runs from three to 400 milligrams per liter. That's where Aurora gets their drinking water right now. That's why they're doing a new $26 million water treatment plant. But anyway, we're getting that water. And as you can see, it's pretty consistent. This, I'm not sure what happened there, whatever. Pretty consistent water. And we are reducing, here's the, here's the red line is the resultant effluent of sulfate. It's got some peaks in there, boom, boom, boom. That first peak, more on the left, is when we switched to the St. James pit water, it had more sulfate. It takes time for the bacteria to react and accommodate to that. At first, it's easy, and, lets it, and then they build up more community, and then they take care of it and drops down. And then we decided to double or triple our flow, push the system a little bit harder. And that's the other peak, and it took a little while for the biology to catch up. So you see it catches up, and then we're taking out essentially all of the sulfate consistently, okay? These are based on actual test results, okay? That's a picture of the test setup in my basement over by Birch Lake, okay? And for all of you here, you wanna come see it sometime, just get in contact with me and you're welcome to come and see it and what we're really doing every day. We do testing two times a week. So on this, these first two columns are our bioreactors. There are two of them to simulate the depth of the bioreactor in the field, which is about 10 feet deep down into the water, okay? And then it, and here's, we got a pump that feeds the food to it, the nutrient pump, goes in the bottom here, up there, overflows down to the bottom of that one up here and then on. And then the new part of the system is how we take care of the hydrogen sulfide. The water coming off of those bioreactors, if I stuck it under your nose, you'd go, ew, because it smells like rotten eggs. And you don't want to be breathing it. Just to do the biological reduction of sulfate, hydrogen sulfide is not a good end game. You now have to do something with the hydrogen sulfide. And that's where we've been working these past few years, couple of years. So you remember that first diagram and say, if there is iron in the right form available, it will react with the hydrogen sulfide and become insoluble as iron sulfide. And then it's no longer doing the bad things. So we're on the iron range. Here in Ely, we used to have hematite. Don't have much anymore. So we went to taconite pellets. Taconite are iron, right? But do taconite pellets work for that? No, they don't because they are iron oxide. Iron already very firmly bonded to oxygen. Therefore, not very reactive. Yeah, they rust, but they take a long time. We need something fast, right? So what about DRI pellets? 
And um, I'm just gonna pass around here if you don't mind. Those are DRI pellets. And these are another form of DRI. And the question then was, would they serve the purpose? DRI, direct reduced iron, okay? What is it? They look like that, what's in the jar there, okay? They're not gonna bite or anything, but they are reactive. Why? They've had the oxygen stripped off of them. That's called the reduction process, removing the oxygen, okay? And that's what we need to do with our taconite pellets here because it's a value added. Because now those pellets can go into an electric arc furnace and make steel without carbon dioxide pollution, okay? The pellets are made a couple different places in the US. The briquettes are made a couple different places. Briquettes primarily are made by Cleveland Cliffs at their facility in Toledo, Ohio. From Minnesota, taconite pellets, okay? So you say, can they do it? Because DRI, direct reduced iron, is now 97% metallic iron, not 63, 64, 65%. It's reduced no oxygen, meaning it wants to react with something. Hydrogen sulfide will react with DRI very readily, either with the individual ions of iron or adsorption onto its surface, okay? And the other interesting thing about DRI is it's electrically conductive. Taconite pellets are not. We tried to use taconite pellets in the past. Mm, kind of worked if you got years and years and years to do a couple gallons. They're not very reactive. DRI is. So we first made a column of just DRI pellets to try the adsorptive capacity of them. What will they do just letting that hydrogen sulfide stick on their surface? They will do it. And so, and they're nice and round, water flows through them easily, bum, 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 easy. So we did that and here's the result we got, okay? Here's the hydrogen sulfide. Here's the result and after going just through that passive bed, it worked really good at the beginning, didn't it? But it's only got so much surface area, right? And it gets used up, getting saturated there. It'll work, but it gets saturated. That means you need a lot of iron to do it. Um, but it can be done. So then we said, oh, let's take these DRI pellets and make electrodes out of them, okay? Uh, my business partner tells me, I don't make things like a hillbilly, I make them like a guy in the woods, you know, which I am. So we made electrodes. That's just some uh, some plastic sleeves, put some pellets in it, those pellets, okay? It's electrically conductive. So we constructed a few of those and then apply a low DC current to them. We start out 12 volts, currently running about 24 volts, not high current or whatever. And each of these electrodes become iron, uh, what do you call it when it goes away? Anyway, the anodes that get used up, you use the iron from sacrificial, no oxygen, no. Oxide. Oxide, no, no. What we are doing with them is we are applying current so that you make iron go from one electrode to the other. So we're taking iron ions, charged iron particles, and making them flow from one pole to the other. Here's a proof of concept. The one on the left there is a little jar, static jar. And we just applied a current. Can you see the black being formed on the right hand? That's iron going from trying to go from one electrode to the other and encountering the hydrogen sulfide that's dissolved in the water and making iron sulfide. That's what I say. We make flax stuff. Pass that around. And so we were doing this to say, yes, it does react, but also to say it goes down. 
it doesn't flow up. It's heavier than the water. The one on the right there, you see it forming and going down. That's actually got water flowing through it with 71 milligrams per liter of sulfide. It started out 278 of sulfate. Through this, we got to less than one milligram per liter of sulfate and sulfide. That was just a kind of a proof of concept. Now in the last nine months, how's that been going? Well, here's the period we were using Spring Mine Creek water, and then we changed to the like so our biology varied a little bit, but we've gotten over 99% sulfide removal consistently. Now this is hydrogen sulfide that we produce from the sulfate, but you gotta get rid of it, right? And we are able to do it and make the hydrogen, the iron sulfide, which is a solid. And we wanna be able to pump it out. So this is a collection, a jar similar to the one passing around. And we just stir it up a little bit and you can see how it's, it's loose. It's relatively small particles. They've been flocculated, they've settled out. And then you watch these and they settle down pretty quickly. What does that mean? It's pumpable. It's a recoverable slurry. We can take it out of the system. Why is that important? Every one of those iron are attached to sulfur. So we're removing the sulfur from the system. Why do we want to remove it? First off, we want that material. It's got value. Second, you can't recreate the sulfate then if you've removed the sulfur. So the whole idea is do it and remove it from the system. Don't leave it there. Otherwise, it will reoxidize back into sulfate. How does it look starting? How does it look at the end? That's St. James pit water. Looks pretty good, doesn't it? Got about 350 milligrams per liter of sulfate and it doesn't taste very good. And you probably have to go to the bathroom real quick, but anyway. Uh, here's after reducing the sulfate to hydrogen sulfide. Still pretty clear, right? But it stinks to high heaven, okay? And then after doing, oh, back up. After doing the iron treatment, you can see it's a little bit tinged, dark. It's got a little bit of suspended iron in it yet, but they can come out different ways. But that has very, very low sulfate, very, very low sulfide. We've cleaned up those two things. So what's a summary of kind of what we've done so far? Proven consistent 99 plus percent sulfate reduction. Okay, I think we're taking care of the sulfate. Biologically, okay. And then we do reactive iron treatment. Two forms, absorption onto the DRI pellets with a passive system or with the electrode system. And this is the basic formula on it. Okay, H2S minus. Why do I say H2S minus not HS minus and not H2S, our waters tend to be very alkaline. They are not acidic. This St. James pit runs about 8.5 pH. It is not acidic. Therefore, we don't have a lot of H's in there. Therefore, it makes HS minus, which we like because it doesn't gas off so much. But when you add it to iron, you get iron sulfide. But what happens to the H in there? it becomes hydrogen gas. You know, electrolyzers that take water molecules and break them into hydrogen and oxygen, they're breaking apart hydrogen and oxygen. Here we're breaking apart sulfur and hydrogen. Similar process, actually it's a lot easier to do, it takes less energy because it's not so solidly bonded as water is. And then we collect the iron sulfide and the sulfidized DRI. What's sulfidized DRI? It's the DRI pellets coated with the hydrogen sulfide. It's been sulfidized. Both of those are usable products for groundwater remediation work to take out things like chlorinated solvents and other things that contaminate our groundwater. And in the future, hydrogen. We're not mucking around with the hydrogen right now. That's a little bit over my pay grade, but we do generate hydrogen. You can see it bubbling off. So 
Iron sulfide is usable for groundwater remediation. Some other things too, like cleaning up mercury and coal-fired power plants, or we can do, do away with coal-fired coal -fired power plants anyway, but it is used for that. And under the Inflation Reduction Act, if we make hydrogen and power it with renewable energy, like solar panels or wind, there's a $3 a kilo uh, subsidy for green hydrogen. We're not counting on that to pay for this system, okay? But it's there, kind of a card in the pocket. So our system is three stages. The first one, biological reduction of sulfate to hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen sulfide to iron sulfide with reactive iron, followed by settling out and removal of the iron sulfide. So the iron sulfide goes down, it's pumped off as a slurry, a usable product, and then the clear water with no sulfate in it goes off. So what are our results so far? We can reduce sulfate to a low level, easily below 10 milligrams per liter. You can get it down even lower if you want to, but it has low capital costs. I don't know about any of you, but you know, our bioreactors did not look very high tech. They're not polished stainless steel, They're big plastic bags, okay? It's not high capital costs. It is scalable and because it's modular, you can start with a few, prove it out. Yeah, this is doing just perfect. And then you can scale it up to 100 gallons a minute, to 1,000 gallons a minute, to 6,000, to 10,000 gallons a minute. Yes, that's possible. For the biological stage, what do we add? Food for the bacteria. It's based on from different forms of alcohols. It's totally biodegradable. And we try to measure it in so that it gets totally consumed by the bacteria. We don't want it going downstream, nor do we want to waste it. The DRI, sulfide treatment, well, it's made with DRI. DRI is something that the steel companies do already make. Cleveland Cliffs does. They won't give me any of it, but they do make it, okay? Uh, other steel companies do. Um, U.S. Steel is getting into it. For you that are following the U.S. Nippon Steel purchase or not, whatever, Nippon Steel knows very well how to make DRI. And that's something we need on the iron range. So we'd like to use a local product for it. Whoops. Supposed to go forward. We could use 100% renewable energy that could power the system. The water flow through it can easily be done by gravity. Solar or wind could run the electrodes. And in the future, you could potentially collect the hydrogen, which has a definite value to it also, and then be used on site. Our mines around here will be using hydrogen in the future for some things, maybe to make DRI. Maybe they're on their mine haul trucks. I'm not sure, but it will be used. I'd like to talk now about a couple of local applications, just to show you that this is not ah, somewhere else, not around. We got iron around here, okay? And we got a couple of situations. I'd like to talk about two of them. Birch Lake just went on the impaired waters list for sulfate. Okay, it's draft yet, but it's gonna stay. The last Friday, they were often comments. I'd like to comment some about that. Where does that sulfate comes from? It's very clear when you look at the research or the data behind it, you know, uh, that was collected from some different fonts. One of those data points do come from Wicola, okay, who's been like 30 years monitoring certain aspects of the white iron chain of lakes. And in the main body of Birch Lake in front of Dunker River and up at the Narrows, we are showing higher than 10 milligrams per liter. When you go up by the Quishway, right up there by the Outward Bound School, which means you're seeing water coming out of the boundary waters. It's typically below one milligram per liter. That typically, because what we've been using really only has a precision below three. And then the outflow out to white iron has been recently over three, okay? So we're gonna talk a little bit about where that comes from. And then the other case is the St. James Pit Lake by Aurora, 
DNR is responsible for that. And they need to manage the water level. They've been pumping it out, the city has, the past two winters, because otherwise it would flood out their pump house. That is a sulfate level of 300 to 400. It's over the drinking water standard and way over the wild rice standard. And they pump it into the first creek that goes into the Partridge River. But that water also has zebra mussels in it. So they only pump in the wintertime when the zebra mussels are kind of dead, okay? But it's going into a natural river with three to 400 milligrams per liter of sulfate and dead zebra mussels, and they can't pump in the summertime. And they say, well, we can do that on the sulfate because the Partridge River is already way higher than that. It's way over 600. But diluting with a three to 400, you don't get closer to 10. Okay, the math doesn't work, but um, they're doing it. And this month, they're starting to do it for this winter. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. But first, I got to lay claim that I know a little bit about this. Because I do preach about it, okay? Well, do you recognize anybody there? That's my brother and I on a big inner tube coming from Reserve Mine at that time, 1964. We said, oh, we want an adventure. So we put into the Dunker River at Scott Road, Tomahawk Trail, okay, and floated down the Dunker River from Tomahawk Trail to Birch Lake. We thought it was gonna take an hour, a couple hours, you know, just straight shot. Well, the Dunker River is not a straight shot. It took us a full hour, eight hours. <laughs> By the time we got down to Duncan, the falls going down to Madela's in Birch Lake, my dad was walking up the river looking for bodies, you know. Well, we come rolling our inner tube down the rapids there, and there we were. So I do claim a little bit of intimate knowledge of a slow, winding river with lots of biological activity. So when you think back to that original diagram of sulfate and what happens, that's in that muck down in the bottom of these streams, just like Dunker River, okay? And so if anybody wonders why I'm a little passionate about it, remember that picture. My brother there, Greg, unfortunately, passed away last May. So that's a little bit of honoring him. So there's a Google Earth picture of Birch Lake up here, the Dunker River going upstream. It goes right between the Dunker Pit and North Shore Mine. That little spot there, the road goes through and the river goes through there. People say, well, is North Shore going to mine and do that? They can't. There's a river going through there. What are they going to do with the river? What are they going to do with the road? So the Dunker River comes through here and then comes way up over here. Here's where it crosses under Forest Road 116. Okay. We did some monitoring of that, and there's plenty of other data out there, but our data showed here 28 milligrams per liter. Contributing to Birch Lake sulfate, yes. You go up 29, here 45. Oh, it's getting higher. Naturally, it's getting higher. But as you go downstream, it gets more diluted. And nature is reducing the sulfate to hydrogen sulfide. Wherever it can have enough food to do that. And we did that as to say, well, where's the sulfate coming in here? And we went up and found this point. There's a bridge there and a gate. You can't go beyond it because then it goes on a North Shore property. But right there, what's the sulfate? Zero. It's coming in between there and there. What's here? North Shore Mine, Peter Mitchell Pit. Here's a more detailed look at that. Up here is where it was the 45, down here is where it's a zero. Here's the confluence of the Dunka with Langley Creek. This creek here, see that curvy and windy? Where's it go? It goes right up beside the North Shore. According to the Quetico Superior newsletter, they said that North Shore is pumping their sump water into Langley Creek, which then goes into the Dunka River. Well, there's the Langley Creek. 
here's North Shore, here's the Dunker River. If they want to get rid of that sump water, sump water is this water that's in the bottom of the pit that they have to pump out, otherwise you'll flood the pit. I'll bet you 10 to 1, it goes into the Langley Creek, it goes down, and then it meets there, and that's why this is 45 up here, there. Why is this critical? Because if you treat it up here, as it's coming out of the pit, it's where you have the lowest flow and highest concentration. It's the easiest place to remove the sulfate before it goes downstream. So it's important. Now, I kind of made some comments about this to the MPCA in their draft impaired waters list, and I have shared that with North Shore and said, hey, we should work together on seeing about solving that, and I'll bet you'll be surprised at how inexpensive it is. It's not reverse osmosis, it's not energy intensive. Put some food in for the bacteria and iron, the kind they produce in Toledo. So, but then let's talk a little bit about the St. James Pit by Aurora is another example. There they need to manage the water levels. They should control the legal to below 10 milligrams per liter because the Partridge River does flow into wild rice areas. And they need to eliminate the zebra mussels to be able to pump it out because they're not supposed to pump aquatic invasive species downstream. Here's a broader view. There's the St. James Pit. Here's Aurora. Come on. Over here is Hoyt Lakes. You guys know where those are, right? Okay. This goes up to the height of Giant's Ridge up here, where Masabi Nugget used to be. What's uphill from the St. James Pit? All of these taconite mine pit lakes. Every one of them. 1,000, 3,000 milligrams per liter of sulfate. That's where the sulfate is coming from that goes into the St. James Pit. Okay, just to put things into perspective. And we can't really treat all of the water in the St. James Pit, but we can treat any of the water that's discharged from it downstream. And why can we, how do we eliminate the aquatic invasive species? We're taking our water from deep. We don't want oxygen. We have to get rid of all the oxygen, otherwise it, the bacteria won't steal the oxygen from the sulfate. Only in an anoxic, anaerobic environment will they do that. So there's no oxygen. If the zebra mussels did get in our system, you had 10 feet of a fiber mat they would have to get through. I don't think they'd get through it. In our sulfate reducing bioreactors, any residual dissolved oxygen is gone. Zebra mussels need oxygen to live. With no oxygen, they die. That's why they're not deep down. But on top of that, the hydrogen sulfide that we are producing would kill them. So they're not going to live through the system. So any discharge from mine pit lake that would go through our sulfate reduction system would not have zebra mussels in it or any other aquatic invasive species for that matter. So we take care of that problem as well. What are our next steps? We'd like to identify a pilot field site. We'd like to do it at St. James Pit. The DNR was allocated in the legislature last year, two and a half million dollars to do this. Will they do it? I don't know yet, but they do have the money for it. We would like to also raise, oops, sorry about that. Uh, you know, the costs for, for doing that. I personally don't have the money to do it. We'd like to build and install a pilot system, initially up to 48 gallons per minute. Why 48? Because we already got the materials to do that much, okay? And it'd be a good show. To handle all the water that they need to, control the water levels, we'd have to do about 600 gallons per minute, which is totally feasible. 
if we monitor our own results, you guys might believe me, but not much of anybody else. So you have to have third party monitoring. In our field test, NTS did our field monitoring and Polymet actually contributed paying for all the water testing and monitoring. Uh, we would like third party monitoring. We would like to involve the Fond du Lac tribe in that monitoring. We would like them to say, hey, this is what can be done. Come out and double check us, right? Really prove it. We'd also like to create a video about that, how it works, a simple one, so that people can better understand it, because I'll bet you it's not the first thing you were thinking about last night when you went to bed, okay? Not many people are all that conscious of sulfate reduction and all this stuff, but it's good for people to understand it better. And we would like a test site that can allow visitors out, go walk on it, see what's happening, see the water going in, see the water come, understand it, because there is this image that, oh, we can't do it, which was before PolyMet proved that reverse osmosis can do it. But that's really expensive. Well, this might cost 1% or a tenth of 1% of reverse, reverse osmosis. And we'd like to show it so people can come out and take high school science classes out there to view it. That's why we'd really like to do it St. James Pitt in Aurora. That's my pitch for that. So anyway, the Clearwater Biologic, we do the theme. We think what we're doing is good for the environment. Save some wild rice better water quality, et cetera. It's also good for jobs and culture. Well, yeah, it helps protect mining jobs, culture, Native American culture, wild rice and all that stuff. And it's also good for business on all different sides, including my business because we'd like to be producing these in Babbitt or area and monitoring them out in the field. You have to be monitoring them, that creates jobs. And so just to remember a little bit about those two little guys floating down Dunker River. Okay, we're talking a lot about Dunker River right now. So I think I got some pretty intimate knowledge of it. In 1964 happens to be when the Clean Water Act came into existence. It was a bit of a watershed year for a lot of good things happening back then, including my trip down the Dunker River. So contact information and that's it. Any questions? I can back up to anything you want. I went fast through that. What was the uh, thick fiber layer? Okay, the question is, what was the fiber layer those fibers composed of? It's composed of recycled post-consumer carpet. Okay, if you remember back on that diagram from it, way back at the beginning, I'm not going all the way back to it, but anyway, um, that cross section was kind of like a cross on it, which gives us lots of fiber. And that's to try to make those fibers stronger and stand up better in your carpet and not get matted down. Okay, so that's where it comes from. So it's a low cost source. You could use virgin new fiber if you wanted to, it just cost a bit more. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, the question is, besides zebra mussels, would the process also kill other animals, insects, etc.? cetera? Um, I would have to say probably yes, um, but because we're taking water from deep in a mine pit lake, um, generally below 30 feet, uh, we're doing that to avoid oxygen. By the fact that we don't have oxygen, most of your other aquatic creatures like fish or whatever are not gonna be there because they need oxygen higher up. Now, if they did come into our system, yes, they would not, they would die, okay? Because we take out even more oxygen and we put in hydrogen sulfide, which is toxic. Any other questions? No, it's not.
Um, answering the last question first, you'd think that would be other place that would be interested in that? Yes. Um, Aurora is an example. They are concerned about their wastewater treatment plant because the water coming out of that has more than three milligrams per liter of sulfate. So they've been running tests about what can be done about that. Um, I've not participated in those tests on the wastewater. My position is, where's it coming from? People don't contribute that much sulfate to a system. They contribute a little bit. It's coming from the St. James pit where they get their water from. So if you don't take it from there, they're gonna take it from uh, Embarrassed Lake now, which has, instead of three to 400, it may have got 50 to 60 milligrams per liter of sulfate. So that is gonna reduce it for them. But I think in any place where you get your water, if you're getting it from a source that has high sulfate, you're gonna have sulfate in your wastewater treatment. And my position is it's a heck of a lot easier to get the sulfate upstream from those mine pit lakes than after it's wastewater coming out of a city. Okay, uh, but yes, they are concerned. And where is the sulfate standard applied. It is a state standard. It's not federal. And it should be applied, standard applies, to any waters flowing into wild rice producing waters, either currently producing or have produced in the past. The problem is it's never been enforced. Okay, there's talk of enforcing it, but it's never been enforced yet. Question. Well, um, when Erie Mining or LTV closed down in 2001, the state of Minnesota sued them. And they came up with what is called the consent decree, where um, the mine there, which is now owned by Cleveland Cliffs, said that they would do something about it when and if they could. So they did build on the shores of the Dunka Pit uh, a treatment plant that took care of some of this stuff. Well, originally it was an active one. And then they had to shut that down for maintenance and they built a passive wetland one that actually did better than the active one. So they never restarted the active one. They have a series of levees that the water goes through and it does reduce some of the dissolved metals and it does take out some of the sulfate, but nowhere near meeting any standards on either one of them. Okay, um, and it's frankly there, it's not the DNR, it's the MPCA that sets those rules and who monitors and controls it is Cleveland Cliffs. Eighty-seven parts per million. Okay, according to Becky, yeah, eighty-seven. Yeah, I did not include that in mine because I think Lisa and you folks have got some good data on that, and I don't have very good access to it. I can't get back in there unless I do it in the summertime. What? I've got it. I've got it. But in in this one, I wanted to do our data on the Dunker Creek and the Dunker River. Okay, but there is plenty of data out there that identifies where the sulfate is coming from into Birch Lake. It's coming from No Name Creek and Bob Bay or the Dunker River. That's where it's coming from. And there's big red arrows that say right from here. You wanna read them. Oh. Yes, Becky. Um, somebody seems to be talking about water treatment to deal with water pollution caused by the mining company. I'm going to repeat your question and paraphrase it a little bit for the people on Zoom. Okay. This is Becky Ram, who is saying that 
You know, the sulfate in the St. James pit by Aurora has high sulfates, which is causing them to spend, somebody to spend $26 million on a different treatment plant, um, embarrassingly, when the sulfate is clearly coming from the upstream mine thing. Is there any action looking for recourse, basically, from the mines that caused this original pollution? Um, not that I know of is my answer on that. Not that I know of, okay? Uh, I think one of the things behind it is, this is not an active mine. It's a legacy mine. And they allege, we don't have any money to do anything because they also don't have any revenue on that mine site, okay? But it's very clear where the sulfate comes from. If you go out to the St. James Pit, you can see where the water on the northeast end of the lake there is welling up as it comes underground from those other upstream mine pit lakes that all have much higher sulfate in them. Um, yes, to the degree it would keep accumulating until it comes to equilibrium with whatever is upstream from it. Okay, and so yes, it continues going up. And because there is no surface outlet, it doesn't go anywhere unless you pump it out, which is the issue what they have to do to maintain the water level in it. Just of interest, the pit lake immediately above the St. James pit is one where they had to remove a lot of Duluth complex overburden that's stockpiled much like the Dunka pit on the shores of it. So there was talk in the past of maybe having to bulldoze that down and put it into the backfill into the mine pit lake so that it would be kept underwater and therefore not as reactive. Right now it's just on the shore. Uh, so there's been a lot of analysis. On it. I have not participated in that, but I've heard about some of it. Uh, but no, they've not been held accountable for it. Um, Okay, good question. Um, the question was, we've been doing this pilot testing, this lab testing, the bench scale testing, the field test some years ago, but when do we expect or, to go to real production, should we say, in the field with a real live system, right? Well, I hope this summer, but I don't decide on that alone. No, it's not dependent on financing. It's dependent on getting the authorization from the appropriate authorities for it to happen, okay? Um, from the mining company, you get pushbacks. Yeah, you know, we don't really need it yet. Nobody's making us do it. On the St. James Pit by Aurora, is it the city responsible or is the DNR responsible, but it's the MPCA that sets the standard and enforce it, who's responsible, who can authorize it. What I did get so far is an authorization from the DNR to use water from the St. James Pit because it does have zebra mussels in it. It's an infested lake. You cannot legally transport that water anywhere because you run the risk of contaminating other water bodies. I got it to transport it to my lab, okay? And we're gonna go out and get some water this evening, okay? But we do not have the authorization to do a project anywhere yet. So you first need the authorization to do it. Get that, and whoever's giving you that might have some funds for it, and you can do it. In the case of BNR, last year they said they didn't have the money for it. Well, the legislature allocated $2.5 million for the St. James Pit. So they can't say don't have the money. And Friday this week, there'll be a DNR roundtable in Bloomington. Uh, signed up for it, gonna be there. Okay, I was a little disappointed that on the program, they really don't talk about much of anything except moose in Northern Minnesota, right? And they do not talk about these topics. Well, I'm hoping some of the key people from DNR will be there and they will be questioned about. Um, 
Okay, yeah. Lacey is asking, how is the mining, how is our work being perceived by the mining company? Um, historically, not very well. Okay. Um, I have gotten the comment before from a particular mining company that says, yes, yes, maybe someday, but it's much cheaper to do nothing. And they decided to hire their lawyers instead and fight it all the way up to the Minnesota Supreme Court. Okay. Because it was written into their permit back in 2018. They didn't like that. Uh, and so basically what I'm saying is there is a way. I unfortunately used a word they didn't like one time. I said it was affordable. And they said that I don't know what affordable is for them. And I said, well, it's, you know, Less than 10% of what reverse osmosis said still costs something. It's cheaper to do nothing. So other people say I'm trying to enable the mining companies. Well, I think we ought to solve the problem instead of just arguing about it. Like Lacey said at the beginning, I'm not one to be shouting about this stuff. Let's work on it. Let's solve the darn problem because taconite mining and iron mining, we do have today. You can go out and test the water in every one of these mine pit lakes and tailings basins. You know what it is, and there are ways to deal with it.